So my title is The Limit of Method, The Limit of Explanation. As you see, I combine these two topics, the topic of limit and the topic of explanation. And the strategy is that when the, we are in the regions close to the limit, our method, so to speak, is weakened, and then we can perhaps better observe its drawbacks and its merits. This is uh, the strategy of this talk. And uh, I will mainly uh, dwell on some examples and then draw some conclusions out of it. Uh, it will be, of course, limited to the, to the explanation and limits of physics. Uh, in this sense, we are going back to the beginning of this day when we were discussing the limits of biology and mathematics, so in concrete sciences. As you can see, there are different kinds of limits. You can see other pictures. Uh, and the limits uh, can be understood for my purposes in the twofold way. Uh, first, as the limits physics reaches at a given epoch and aims to go beyond them in not too far future. And uh, the second, as the limits physics will possibly never will be able to transcend. Perhaps uh, the second kind of limits is more interesting from the philosophical point of view, but in this talk I focus on the first kind of li limits, postponing the latter to perhaps another occasion. And as I said, I will um, do that mainly by showing an examples and perhaps the one example only. It is a psychological fact that one is seldom impartial when one has to evaluate one's own limitations. This is why in the present talk I take a, take a look at what our predecessors believed to be limits of their physics. So we are going back to the history uh, of physics uh, and when uh, uh, th th this is a good uh, strategy because now we can look backwards from the perspective of somebody who knows the answer. When science and technology make progress, the territory of the secure knowledge expands. The limits recede, and from the perspective of the new conquest, the former battlefield can judiciously be evaluated. And in the following, I focus on one example from the past, and we shall try to look at the limits and how uh, explanations behave in this region, limiting region. And my uh, example will be the so-called vortex theory of matter, today completely forgotten. Uh, it has it had its origin in 1858 when Hermann von Helmholtz uh, published a very important paper on fluid dynamics. Uh, and in this um, paper, he, in a mathematically rigorous way, he showed, he proved that uh, if within the fluid, some, the fluid which is frictionless, from the assumption, so idealized thing. When some closed vortex rings are, sta uh, are formed, they are surprisingly stable. They don't dissipate, they are stable. This was a paper, uh, a technical paper from the hydrodynamics with no ambition of being a fundamental theory. But then, this man, Peter Tate, a Scottish physicist, constructed a device, we can see the sketch of the device, for producing rings of smoke of a very great stability. Uh, we, we have an experience of producing such rings also. Uh, well, and William Thompson, another Scottish physicist, wa was very impressed by uh, the experiment performed by Tate, he, he was witnessing to that experiment 
and was uh, very, very impressed by the stability of these rings. And it happened that he also read the paper by Helmholtz. And he uh, had the following idea. Uh, William Thompson, he was later on, uh, had, had a title of Sir, of Lord, and he was called Lord Kelvin. And he wrote a letter to Hel uh, Helmholtz in which he explained his, his idea. And the quotation is the following. The absolute permanence of the rotation and the unchangeable relation you have proved between it and the portion of the fluid, once acquiring such a motion in a perfect fluid, shows that if there is a perfect fluid in all through the space, constituting the substance of all matter, a vortex ring would be as permanent as the solid hard atoms assumed by Lucretius and his followers. And his idea was that these rings in, in the fluid, the fluid fills in all the space, and if once fluid, uh, rings are formed, they are what chemics, chemists at that time called atoms. So it was the first model of, of an atom. Uh, and this idea became very popular, especially in Britain. Uh, a great James Clark Maxwell was also very interested uh, in that idea. From his correspondence, we know that he did not quite believe in the final success of this uh, vortex theory of matter, as it started to be called. Uh, but he praised uh, the idea for its methodological consistency. And uh, he also close, closely followed the developments of this idea. And this idea was very popular and was developed by many, many physicists, especially uh, uh, in England. In his fundamental work on physical line of force, uh, he noticed the analogy between the lines of fluid motions and the li uh, lines of magnetic force. He also wrote a very famous uh, article to the Britan Encyclopedia Britannica in which he also praised um, the vortex theory of matter for its consistency. And uh, he said that it will save appearances without any artificial hypothesis. So it seems very natural for him. At that time, in the second half of the 19th century, uh, the common idea was that um, the ether uh, fills in the space, and it turned out to be in their um, well, uh, views, necessary as, as a medium for propagation of uh, electromagnetic waves. And it was natural to suppose that um, it is ether in which uh, these vortices are formed. Although Helmholtz uh, and Thompson in their first um, publications, they never mentioned uh, ether, but later on Thompson also it uh, turned out to that idea. Since uh, there were many uh, hypotheses concerning the physical nature of ether, there were also many models of ethereal vortices, uh, and some of them were very highly mathematized. And what is very strange for us, but it was not strange at that time, that from the very beginning, from the first work, the work of Helmholtz and, and Thompson, uh, the idea was not only qualitative, it was, uh, it was highly mathematized from the very beginning. And uh, what is interesting from our point of view, uh, the so-called theory of knots was invented almost specially in order to deal with vortex theory of matter. Uh, the first idea of um, the theory of knots comes from Carl Ga Gauss. Mm, he noticed some regularities in, in, in this area. And his disciple, Johann Benedict Listing, uh, wrote a couple of papers about, uh, about uh, mathematics of knots. But he was lacking the general uh, scheme, uh, mm, uh, mathematical scheme. Uh, Maxwell was interested in vortices not so much because of the physical aspect, but rather because of the mathematical properties. And Tate, the same Tate who, who produced those stable 
uh, rings of smoke. Uh, he um, was interested in, in mathematics of, of knots, and he provided a classification of knots, and he believed that uh, this classification of various knots could explain, uh, well, the atomic physics and how atoms combine uh, to produce uh, chemical compounds. For instance, when knots are interwined with each other, so these vortices can do the same. And in this, this was the idea that probably all chemical substances and compounds could be explained in, in that way. Another great physicist at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, Albert Michelson, the same Michelson who, who produced the famous ex Michelson uh, Morley experiment. Uh, he was also fascinated by the vortex theory of matter. And this quotation is interesting because, uh, well, it, it testifies to the ambition of, of, this, um, uh, of, of this theory. All modern investigations tend towards the elucidation of this problem. And the day <coughs> seems not far distant from the converging lines from many apparently remote regions of thought will, be met, will meet on this common ground. Uh, and uh, then he enumerated all things which could be explained by the theory of vortice, vortices. Then the nature of, of atoms and the forces called interplay in the, in the chemical union. The interaction between these atoms and the non-differentiated ether uh, as manifested in the phenomena of light and electricity, the structures of the molecules and molecular systems of which atoms are the units, the explanation of cohesion, elasticity, and gravitation. All this will be marshaled into a single compact and consistent body of scientific knowledge. So it was really a, a paradigm, sort of paradigm uh, at that time. Uh, the vortex theory was also claimed to be a new theory of gravity. Another um, physicist, Kirk Person, uh, wrote uh, about, uh, uh, about the vortex theory, and he was not quite happy with the current versions of that theory, and he proposed uh, another one, uh, its own version of the theory. And he, uh, his improvement consisted in the fact that, in his view, the vortices are not extended uh, entities, but they are of point dimensions, point, point, -like, enti point like entities. And he, he, he said, in this theory, an atom is conce conceived to be a point at which ether flows in all directions into space. Uh, such a point is termed an ether squirt. Uh, two such squares would be attracted to each other. He also speculated about the negative matter, or ether sinks, for the amount squirted into the inc incompressible fluid must be at least equaled by the amount which passes out. So there must be an equilibrium between those por portions of ether which comes into the space and between those which uh, disappear. So we can say that he speculated using our present language into about the mini white holes and mini black holes. So the ether was coming out of, of, of some other place and, uh, and uh, well, or could also disappear. Uh, yeah. uh, also, the, the quotation from, from his idea, he tried to explain where from this ether is coming to our universe? And his answer was surprisingly modern in our view, from other dimensions, of course. And he says mathematicians for, for a long time already uh, invented various dimensions and various geometries, and they can be used to explain uh, the nature of, of this process. Mm, and he said that... Uh, this is a kind of metaphysics, but it will be free from contradictions which abounded in old-fashioned metaphysics. This was his idea. 
Uh, moreover, there were also some theological speculations about vortex theory. Tate was a very pious man, and at that time there were strong materialistic and agnostic uh, as, uh, tendencies in the Victorian Britain. And um, Tate, together with another author, Stuart Belfort, uh, wrote a book whose cover is here. This is the cover from the third edition. The book became a great uh, commercial success. Uh, and the, the title of the book was The Unseen Universe. Uh, physical speculations of the future state. Mm, the, the, the first um, edition was um, um, as an un, uh, un, w without revealing the authors, uh, and here there is a copy of the California Library, University Library, and it is handwritten that it is the names of the authors. <clears throat> but uh, later on, of course, it was known that the uh, authors were Balfour and, and Tate. Uh, the main message of the book was that while the ether around us is imperfect, there are interspersed parallel universes, another idea which is nowadays very common, uh, with more and more perfect ether. In an infinite series of universes, we finally reach the universe of which the intelligent developing agency possesses infinite energy. So they were even theological speculations about the vortex theory. Well, the decline of this theory was rather sudden, similarly like steady state in, in cosmology in the 60s, rather quick decline. The vortex theory of matter was often praised for the methodological reasons for its conceptual clarity, explanation, power, and the mathematical beauty, and uh, last but not least, for its merit in liquidating the duality between ether and, and matter. Michelson once uh, wrote that this theory ought to be true even if it is not. This is a good contribution to the explanation concept in physics. Uh, it seems that such views like these ones uh, essentially prolonged the life of the vortex theory, which in fact by the end of the 19th century was no longer an active area of research. <clears throat> uh, well, we can ask, what about the verdict of experiments? Uh, there were some possibilities. It followed from the theory that the mean velocity of, vortex, of the vortex particles uh, diminishes with the increase of temperature. Whereas it was known from the experiments that the velocity of sound, which should be limited by the mean velocity of the vortices, increased with temperature. So there was a kind of con contradiction. But such discrepancies were explained by appealing to other versions of the theory. It is like today uh, inflation uh, scenario. There are many scenarios and if there is a discrepancy with the experiment, we can also go to another scenario. Uh, all, uh, also, they were treated simply as anomalies or simply ignored. But finally, by the end of the century, uh, the, this theory it disappeared. It is a historical fact that the vortex theory of matter was abandoned not by falsification, but by slow decrease of interest and by advent of the new theoretical conceptions. One of them was the so-called electromagnetic worldview. It's another theory which is nowadays completely forgotten, uh, but uh, also it was superseded by the advent of relativistic and quantum uh, physics, which eliminated all these older conceptions. There is a very interesting book, newly published by the Oxford University Press, by Helge uh, Crack, uh, whom he, we had here as a guest not so long ago. Uh, the book is 
called uh, the higher speculations. Uh, the subtitle is Great uh, Theories and Failed Revolutions in Physics and Cosmology. He, he's a great historian of science and he, his aim was to look at those uh, theories in the past which completely failed, which are now forgotten. And one of them uh, is um, the vortex theory of matter. One chapter uh, is devoted to that theory, but there are many, many others. Uh, and uh, th this book certainly has a certain message for, for today's physicists. And after presenting these failed theories, uh, Crack gives an account of, he calls them, past 1980 developments in physics now, uh, that also could be regarded as higher speculations. And he enumerates and gives a short historical account various cosmological hypotheses based on the idea of variability of physical constants, uh, various cyclic models of the universe, anthropic principles, multiverse controversy, various scenarios of super, super, super strings, life in the universe debate, and cosmic eschatology. And the question is, could we draw a lesson from history to reach a balanced view on these modern uh, speculations? There are some parallels between the vortex theory and, for example, superstring theory, because it's the most obvious example, superstring theory. Uh, in both cases, there was an ambition to evolve into a theory of everything. Domination of mathematical machinery, in both cases, the use of knots theory in, in present uh, superstring theories, not theories, very amply used and developed. Uh, and this, this mathematical side of the theory is dominating over empirical control. Uh, in both cases, there are attempts to incorporate gravity, the production of other universes, claims of methodological advantages, and expanding the field of physical explanations. However, Crack cautiously notes one, one important difference that in drawing parallels between vortex theory and superstring theory, we must be careful since, and quote, we know that matter is not composed of ethereal vortices, but we do not yet know whether or not elementary particles are made up, up of superstrings. But it's perhaps up to the future historians of science to, to see whether uh, which will be the fate of the prevalent speculations. We, sometimes people are asking nowadays, is there in physics an, what they are called epistemic shift? Uh, that is to say, whether the traditional method of physics based on strict cooperation of mathematical modeling and experimental verification is going to change into something more relaxed, into, it will change its rigors and admit some more relaxed criteria of being a scientific theory. Uh, and Crux does not answer this, this question, but uh, gives uh, two short, very up to the point comments. Such proclamations uh, that it will be a future theory of everything such proclamations have almost always turned out to be uh, only rhetoric than reality in the past. When it came to justifying new theory, theories, the, ph the physicists used well-established standards and methods and not some kind of new uh, physics. <coughs> A, a short re mm, remark about the nature of the evolution of, of physics. Uh, this is an evolutionary tree of human brain, by the way, but I treat that as a history, as a natural history of physical um, theories. So mm, when we look uh, from the perspective of the present researcher to the future, we do not know which way the evolution will go, which branch will be a, a main one 
and will end with a success, and which one will be a blind alley. We do not know if we look uh, from bottom up. Evolution of, evolution of science uh, of physics is not predictable because we d there are many possible ramifications and we do not know which way it will go. So this way I it is not predictable. But it is retro-explainable. If we are now here, we can say why, why the vortex theory ended here. So, so it is retro-explainable. Uh, so if we look from, from top to down. And now uh, some remarks on the title of this lecture, Limit of Method and Limits of Explanation. When the method is pushed to its limits and its standard procedures seem to break down, the changes are bigger and easier to grasp its peculiarities and features that are usually screened by the routine. So we, when we are thinking about multiverse uh, inflation and so on, uh, we perhaps can see some drawbacks and some modifications, imminent modifications, possible modifications uh, in method. Questions coming for an answer, uh, claiming for an answer, are generated within domains well settled in, in scientific theories. So questions are coming from inside. It seems that producing chain reactions of questions is an inherent property of the scientific method. If some questions remained unanswered, the resulting ignorance would threaten the conceptual integrity of the domains that so far seemed satisfactorily explained. This is why in, in every epoch, physics creates around its hard core of well-established paradigms and theories, it creates a belt of speculations and very uh, rough ideas. And we cannot say that they are useless. They are necessary in order to, uh, well, to satisfy some heuristic, perhaps, role or to suggest some answers. And if we resign from asking difficult questions, this would, I think, threaten the conceptual integrity of the domains that are already well established. The method of science is aggressive in this, in this sense. It does not tolerate unexplained domains. Uh, I would say that the method prefers shaky explanations that not explanations at all. This effect cannot be reduced to psychological attitudes of social conditionings of researchers. Of course, uh, such, such conditions there exist, but it cannot be entirely um, exp explain this effect. It is, uh, I think, an inherent feature of the scientific method. And at this stage, psychology meets requirements of the method. In everyday life, the proce process of understanding uh, which I think more or less, roughly speaking, is, is a psychological correlate of being explained. So the process of understanding proceeds for, by an attempt to reduce the unknown to the already known. And scientists usually try to transfer this strategy to their disciplines. And in physics, they uh, usually do not succeed. For instance, they did not succeed with the vortex theory. They wanted to reduce the nature of atom to something which was understandable to them, to the vortices in the fluid, but it did not work. Uh, vortices were very well known in classical physics, both theoretically and from the experimental point of view, and it seemed natural to reduce unknown atoms to the well-tamed vortices in the fluid-like medium. This is why Thompson's idea had so many uh, incarnations and was dying so slowly. But this tragedy turned out 
totally, totally unsuccessful. The method of physics does not respect psychological tendencies of physicists. To explain in physics does not mean to reduce to what easily translates to our sense data and creates impression of understanding to our sense data or to something which already we seem to understand. To explain some class, class in, uh, of phenomena in physics means to conceptually prepare a given domain in such a way that it could be subject to the method of physics. Perhaps it's not quite um, precise, this sentence. The, the, to explain in physics is to prepare, to, to prepare class of phenomena. It, it is that first stage of, of the process of explanation. At least, uh, so far, the explanation process in physics proceeded. And strangely enough, when the understanding process is accomplished, it is not by the new domain reduced to our imaginations formed, formed by previous physical theories and morals, but vice versa. Our imagination and our understanding standards are enforced to conform to the new situation. So we are not reducing unknown to already known, but we enforce our imaginations and our customs of thinking to a new situation. The typical example in this, in this field is perhaps the advent of quantum mechanics, when uh, we, we, we had to accustom ourselves to the new way of thinking and doing even this new sort of mathematics. Uh, so it's a common saying among physics, physics university teachers that uh, to understand something is to be accustomed to. This way, this was exactly what happened with the vortex theory. Quantum mechanics has disclosed totally different nature of atoms, and relativity theory has finally annihilated ether, uh, supposed medium of vortices. Uh, the vortex theory has not even been falsified. It has been discarded relegated to the textbooks of the history of physics. Both quantum mechanics, together with quantum field theories and general relativity, together with its cosmological applications, have dominated the explanation of the physical world. And this new explanation, as it was always the case during the history of physics, has generated open questions and disclosed loopholes in our present understanding of the world. And this process is going on. And our question now is, will the history be repeated and all these modern speculations will be disregarded or, uh, or not? Are we really crossing a borderline or not? Thank you.